Hey, look who came over to visit. <laughs> How's it going, high schoolers? <laughs> He's moving back to Nashville. Is it okay to tell him that? Oh, yeah, it's okay. official. We're here. Um, um, how many moves in the last five years? Five and seven years. Five and seven years. Oh and God. I'm still married. Amazing. Barely. Amazing. Someday. I just watched your last video with the, when you were playing slide on the old Super O. Oh, yeah. Great, man. It's great. Oh, yeah, I'll play some tasty chords and you play some tasty licks. Okay.
All right, so, um, God, all right, you're a telly man. Yeah. I always have been. All since, day. Since the... All night. Shit, you got a black or a telly uh, tattooed on your arm, don't you? I sure do. Mm-hmm. Right here under this um, hoodie. What's to look for in a good telly? All right, what are some of the things? I just showed him this uh, 54 here that, that sweet Greg Voros gave me a while back, and I was just yeah. giving him, uh, letting him check it out for a while. And... Uh, I noticed how he, I've told, I've talked about this in some of my previous videos, like how Jed always finds a sweet spot <laughs> on every guitar, like. Well, you know what I like about the good telly is that like, uh, you remember that first Albert Lee Starlix video? I don't think I've ever seen that. He was like from the late 80s, maybe mid 80s. And he's playing like a natural telly and he has this, He's playing the lighter strings, maybe eights or nines, but I love it when tellies are like chatty and splatty. Chatty and you know, splatty. when you can play them with your fingers and they're like, you can hear them rattle on the frets. Yeah. yeah. That's how I like them. Yeah. The necks, you know, there's all kinds of great neck shapes. Yeah. This one's got a really cool kind of like full V, I would call that. He said a minute ago, like, I'm the only guy that he knows that sets him up splatty. So, like, right? And he likes him like that, right? Yeah, I like him. Yeah, it's funny. I don't mind a little rattle down there. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. Especially for that, you know, rapid fire country stuff. But you can still get him to play clean, too. Yeah. Like, if you just touch them. soften up. Yeah, just yeah. touch them. I also want to show the homeschoolers something. One of the one of the viewers came into town yesterday. Look what he brought you. Look what he brought. You. Oh, you know you can't even get this in bottles anymore. <laughs> That's but, what I uh, get. Thank you for Rod bringing those in for us. Uh, Thanks, Rod. Good on you, Rod. I saw him down at Groom's yesterday, and we went upstairs to the inner sanctum, and That's sweet. we were looking around. And now uh, I bought this old guitar. I put up a video ages ago of me playing this before the homeschooling thing. It was uh, this old national guitar. Remember the the Memphis mini guitar? Oh yeah. With that crazy yeah. pickup down by the bridge, it was like a national New Yorker. A square pickup. Nineteen forty, and um, I bought one on Reverb because uh, I really was like, why the hell did I ever sell that guitar? Most unique yeah. sounding pickup. 1940 National New Yorker, and then the thing showed up in the mail a couple days ago, and I pulled it out of the case and uh, plugged it in. There was no sound. Oh, no. And, uh, dead pickup? Dead pickup. I and so I, I immediately texted the guy or, or e emailed him on Reverb, and I was like, hey, mate, uh, the only reason I bought this guitar is a pickup, and it ain't working. So, like, oh. you know, yeah, so I'm going to take it to my guys and see if we can fix it before I sent it back. But I took it to Grunz and uh, they pulled it out and it was dead. But then Peter up there moved one little wire and all of a sudden it came back to life. Oh, 7.9K. Wow. Kicking ass. So Is it the thing. screw in type cable? Like it had an on the top of the guitar, it had an amphenol yeah. lap steel, but then somebody converted it to a, oh, cool. to a quarter inch, which is quite, yeah. it's quite handy to have. Yeah. So. You want to have that these days. Yeah. Show us a cool chord. Yeah. Cool chord? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Well, lately I've been into this. This movie. Uh, this movie thing. Taking an E minor. Yes. Yeah. Show us that. Taking the bones of an E minor, yeah. right? And then sliding the fifth down to the flat fifth and the fourth. Yeah. I see Guthrie doing a lot of that. Oh yeah? That. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, that's a big move for him. He probably got that from me. He probably stole it from you. <laughs> Check it out. It so how, how would you use that in a tune? Let's see. Uh, I would think, well, there would be over E minor. Okay, ready? Give me a groove and okay. I'll play it.
Okay, so how long have we known each other, dude? Uh, we go way back, man. We're getting close to 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember the first time I met you was on a uh, Emory Gordy session. Oh, yeah. I don't remember who the artist was, but... Uh, it was uh, Rebecca Lynn Howard. Rebecca Lynn Howard. Yeah. Man. Okay, so... God, I'll never forget. I was playing... We were both playing electric, and I looked over at you. Yeah. And first thing I noticed was just your total unpredictability. <laughs> yeah, like that's what I love about your playing. You just never know what you're gonna do. Yeah, because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started hanging out. Oh man, uh, all the time. Remember, we would just hang out at the old house. And oh yeah. I'm, I I always think about that time when uh, uh, I, w I went to a guitar show. Okay, many many years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago. And I've always had a penchant for old double necks, right? And at the time, I had a 74 white Gibson double neck that I loved, right? As a matter of fact, people have asked me, of all the guitars that you sold, you know, thousands of guitars you've been through, mm. which one do you wish you had back? And it would be that, that run-of-the-mill 74 white double neck was the best guitar. Wow. And I sold, the only reason I sold it is because I went to a guitar show at the fairgrounds in Nashville, and uh, there was a... A fucking 1959 EDS 1275 in white, mm. 612, four PAFs, mm. and it had custom engraved headstocks. You know how like some of those late 50s, early 60s Gibsons had those embossed custom trophy shop engraved, yeah. mm -hmm. and it said Jimmy Rivers on one neck. Yeah. And it said, and the Cherokees. Yeah. On the oh, other. that's right. I think it was right. Cherokee and uh, I was like, who the hell is Jimmy Rivers in the Cherokee? I have no idea. So, oh, yeah. But I just thought the guitar was so cool. And at the time, imagine this, people. That guitar was $7,500, which would be a $100,000 guitar now, yeah. if you can find it. Yeah. I sold it to uh, Mike Reeder many years ago from, I think Mike still has it, actually. But here's the fun part of the story. So, I didn't know who Jimmy Rivers was, right? And, uh. I brought the guitar home and I had it sitting on my dining room table in the big giant brown case, you know, mm. with the light over it. And I opened that case lid, Jed came over and, and he looked for one second, he goes, oh my God, is that Jimmy Rivers' guitar? <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> in the most, he was, I'll never forget it. I was like, you know Jimmy Rivers? Oh yeah. And you know, Jed grew up in Australia, right? And. Uh, so, I mean... By I, freak accident, do I know him? Well, I knew him because when I was 15, this guy that I really look up to, that lives here in Nashville now, Stuart French, yeah, said, if you want to learn about swing guitar, you should look into this guy, Jimmy Rivers. And right. I was like, well, you know, I lived way out in the on the edge of the desert, South Australian desert. Yeah. Tiny town, and I was like, well, you know, I... Um, how would I ever find a record? He's like, oh, I'll make you a cassette. So he made me a cassette tape of that record, Brisbane Bop. Which is the only record Jimmy ever made. Yeah. It's the only recordings yeah, that yeah. exist, yeah. And yeah. Uh, he sent it to me. But when he dubbed the cassette, it was like, it, the speed was like, <laughs> it was faster than he ever recorded. <laughs> so I got this cassette and I was like, how the fuck is that guy playing that fast? Like, it can't be possible. And so I learned all these songs, you know, like 20 BPM faster oh than they were originally God. recorded and like a quarter tone higher or like a couple Amazing. of keys higher. So, of course um, you learned them. I tried to, yeah, yeah, as much as I could. Did, yeah. But I was like, ah, oh, Jimmy Rivers, you know, it was like fire. Was it disappointing when you found out the original record was way slower? Well, it was, <laughs> it was so weird because like Slow Boat to China was like, you know. <laughs> You know, but I'd learn it like Wow. And then yeah. I was like, holy shit, it actually swings when it's slower. Right. You know? Right. He, he, like he was along the lines of like, you know, Jimmy Bryant's so for all you mm. country swing fans out there, which is Jimmy Bryant, who else was a, a killer at that? You know, Hank Garland. Uh, yeah. Hank Garland. 
That's Paul. But where was Jimmy Rivers from, man? Uh, well, he was an Indian. He was a Cherokee Indian. Okay. So he must have been from Oklahoma, right? Okay, right. And he got, he tells a story, and there's these amazing recordings. There's a Rhino CD that came out with a bunch of other live recordings because Vance Terry had Vance recorded Terry. some shows. Fuck yeah. He was the steel player. Yeah. And the steel playing on those records is outrageous. Yeah. He was um, like his Speedy Whips. He was his Speedy Whips. Right. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. And also, I would, I would also say, like, he might have had two or three pedals, but this was like pre. Um, I don't think there were a lot of people playing those kind of voicings and playing jazz on steel at that point. Right, right. Like, this is even pre Buddy Emmons. Pre Buddy Emmons, because it's 61 to 64. Yeah, right. I don't know. I'm not right. a steel aficionado by right. any means, but yeah. when you listen to the voicings that Vance Terry is playing, like it is some far out shit, right. man. It is like yeah, from outer yeah. space. Amazing. Anyway, so um, you know it's funny. Like I, I was so enamored with that guitar because it was so rare. Yeah, but in honesty, it wasn't that great of a guitar. Those those old double necks were custom ordered, and they had they had a spruce top, you know, and it was hollow. And it, even though it had four PFs on it, it sounded like it had a blanket over it. Oh. It didn't. It played great, but it, I was so taken with the rarity of it, you know. And I and I, and it's, when I got that fifty nine white double neck, I sold my seventy four that was really actually a way better guitar. Oh yeah. But I thought you can't have two fucking white double necks, so I sold the <laughs> seventy four. Right? There's rules well, against not that. Not tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You wouldn't ever tell anybody. All right. So that brings up. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, right? You and I. I mean, guitar nerds, bro. I mean, Jed and I are both known for sort of never holding on to anything guitar-wise, right? Yeah. Been through thousands of guitars. Slippery and, hands. Uh, yeah, yeah, like very slippery hands. hands. Um, so when you think back on all the ones you've been through, give me a top three of ones you wish you had back. Oh. Um, uh, man, I, I wish I still had the... 53 black guard that I got from Joe. Joe Glazer. Glazer. I don't remember that guitar that well. Oh man, it had the bridge pickup of Doom. It was like loud and kind of very P90 ish, you know, like, but dark. It was like, it wasn't your typical twangy telecaster. It was right. like dark and full and dangerous. Powerful. Yeah, but you the know, neck pickup was terrible. Well, Joe, Joe Glazer is the kind of guy that will literally find black guard tellies laying around in a closet that he forgot he had. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's got so much shit. <laughs> and he, yeah, and he, he knows you and I better than we do. So, like, him and I, Jed and I both bugged Joe over, you sell us some of your guitars, and he'd be like, I would, except you guys are never going to keep them. <laughs> yeah. So he, like, I bought a black guard telly off of Joe Glazer many years ago, fucking mm. 20 years ago, and of course, I didn't keep it. He was right. Um, yep. I wonder if it was the same guitar. I doubt it. No, it couldn't have been. Uh, yours was light. Mine was kind of heavy, I think. Yeah, mine was mid weight. It wasn't too yeah, light. Yeah. But it, it had been painted brown. Like the whole oh, thing. Oh. It was in okay. A, it was like um, he had spent years taking that brown finish off of it. Right. And you sold it. Yeah, I sold it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's number two? Um, number two is. Uh, Oh man, that 64 Hummingbird I bought from you. Natural Hummingbird. I remember that one vaguely. Yeah, you only had it for a little while. Yeah. It was two grand, if you can believe two that. Two grand. Or 1800 bucks, maybe. Man, that was a good acoustic. I don't know why I sold that. Uh, but a songwriter, a girl, has it in Nashville now. She still has it? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, she's a sweet gal. I'm glad she's got it. Yeah, That's and she'll cool. keep it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, like favorite guitar. And so, I mean, why do we sell instruments the way we do? Is it because we're not collectors? Uh, why do we do that? Yeah. Well, we've talked about this. It only takes one to three times of a guitar not doing what you wished it did in the right. moment for you to get over it. 
fucking A, man. You know explain I mean? that in great detail. That is very important. Say it again. Yeah. How does it, how do you mean? It, when a guitar is not doing something. You take it to a session. Take it to a session. Or a gig. Or a gig. And you're, you know, you, the heat is on and you're trying to get something out of the instrument that is just not delivering. Yes. Uh, man, it quickly becomes very, I become unattached so quickly. And I'm yeah. like, yes. I will not miss that. It's right. not doing what it, right. what's required. Even if it has delivered in the past, if it goes a couple of times without giving it to you. Yeah. It still gets on the, yeah. On the pile, I know, in the launch pile. <laughs> I know, I know, man, I'm the same way. Or a pedal or something, if you click on it a few times and it's just like, yeah, that is not what I'm looking for. That fucker's gonna go. Yep. And you and, and you may not sell it right then, but you've got it in your mind the that seed that's has, gonna go. Yeah, this, the seed has been planted mm -hmm. for sure. And then you start looking for something else and then you're like, well, if I found something else, then that thing would be out right. first. And then, you know. One thing I'm realizing now is that uh, my our, our both of our pension to do that type of thing is becoming less and less of a positive thing because guitars just in general are getting so hard to find. I mean, back in the old days, we could buy and sell and flip guitars like crazy, but there was plenty of them around to get to yeah. replace. But now it's like all of the guys that I know, the vintage dealer guys, you know, that, that like Elliot and Groons and all those guys, Rumble Seat, the, their only complaint, the business is great, but they just can't find any guitars yeah. to sell. Yeah. And like, you know, COVID and all these things have sort of, made it impossible to find guitars in, in like, let alone a magic guitar, right? Cause I always talk about that, you know, like, you know, you can find guitars, but finding a magical instrument that truly is transcendent. Oh man. I mean, that's a special thing in any lifetime. And like, you know, they used to be more plentiful and now yeah. it's really rare to find anything. Yeah. And uh, how about this crazy shit that's going on with tubes, man? Do you know about this? I just heard about it yesterday. Um, because they're all made in Russia, right? Yeah. No one can get tubes anymore. Wow. Well, when I heard strings and necks, because all the nickels in Russia. So people are buying up strings like crazy. Ebo. I don't know. I'm the... I had breakfast with Ebo the other day, and he was just like, dude, I just saw my life flash before my eyes, man. I'm a... He called all of his sources that he's been getting tubes from for years, and so they can't get, they can't get anything. And if anybody does have anything, like a tube that used to be $10 is now $100. Holy shit. So like Mike Skaggs, the guy that made the Tweed Deluxe that I showed you guys several videos ago, he's got orders to build all these amps and he can't get any tubes. Oh, wow. So now what? That's crazy. Now what are we gonna do? Go back to playing our uh, Lab Series L5? <laughs> have you ever had a good solid stadium? Custom 250. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like Best of... solid state amp you ever played? Uh, the custom two hundred and fifty. Yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Mine was a Vox Defiant. Oh yeah. I had it years ago. I sold it to Johnny McBride. It's still over at Blackbird, but goddamn, that thing sounded good. Yeah. You ever heard one of those? I haven't heard that one. I had a Berkeley two for a while. Yeah. It was really cool. Yeah. It was it's... a two hundred and ten cab. Those early Vox Solid State offerings were quite cool. Yeah. That yeah. thing had a uh, built-in distortion that was just fucking rad. Wow. Uh, and a mid-range, uh, you know, the MRB, the, you just, you go, you flip through all the different frequencies. Oh, you ever wow. seen that? No, I mid-range selector. It's, uh -huh. Remember at the end of uh, Birthday by the Beatles? Yeah. At, you know, down, do, 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 yeah. On the piano? Yeah. It's that somebody flipping through the controls of an MRB. Oh, shit. Because I mean, no that's way. what they were using on like Sgt. Pepper and really? all that shit. Yeah, it's very cool. And uh, that amp sounded so cool. And those are really hard to find. There was like three amps in that Vox early solid state thing. They were all the same amp with different wattages the, the Defiance, mm -hmm. the Conqueror, uh -huh. and the Supreme. Yeah, right. And the Beatles really did use those, like on Sgt. Pepper and stuff. That was a lot of those guitar sounds were those early solid state boxes. Oh, wow. 
you know, um, very cool. Yeah. Uh, another one that I should have never sold. I asked Johnny if he wanted to sell it back, and he said no. Well, um, mm -hmm. there's Rickenbacker Transonic Sonic. That's an amp I've never owned. Never tried one. They were like, you can't even find one, right? Yeah, the only ones I've ever seen are at Rumble Seed. He's got a bunch of them. Yeah, right. He's had those forever. Those are all solid state, right? I think so. I don't even know what they sound like. Yeah. I've never tried one. I don't know. Um, what are you, where are you at with, uh, what else have you been thinking about musically lately? Man. Uh, Moving? I'm living. <laughs> <laughs> Music I've been listening to. Man, I'll tell you a record I've been listening yeah. to that I knew about but didn't really know about is that Wilco record, Sky Blue Sky. Oh, right. You know that record? Never heard it, man. Is it awesome? Man, it's fucking great. There are some moments on there that are really incredible band moments. Yeah. Like, you can tell... I love bands. Oh, dude. You know? Real bands. Real bands. Yeah. Where it's like the sum of all the parts. Yeah. Man. And I do love like the understated vocal delivery of Jeff Tweedy. Yeah. On any given day. Yeah, man. You know, I, the sound of people trying, I fucking cannot even I'm deal not, with it anymore. I'm, not. I'm like, stop shouting at me. Right. Stop singing at me. Right. Like that guy is like. Right. He just writes whatever the fuck comes into his yeah, head, man. and that's what he sings. And it's it may not be the perfect narrative, right, or, or whatever, but it's always interesting. It'd be a fun band to be a member of, right? You ever think about like what bands you could somehow, if you could just take the stage one night and some the from be transport to being a member of a band. Wouldn't it be cool? I would try. I thought it'd be cool to be in Radiohead too. Oh yeah. Like not to be me in Radiohead. I mean to be one of the members of Radiohead. They probably have a blast. Yeah. When they're playing, it looks like a fun gig. It's got to be so fun. Yeah. I mean, I've seen them a couple of times. And it's, yeah. It looks like a party up there. Oh, man. definitely. You know. For sure, they got a good thing going. Um, yeah. You're in. You you just said you were working on um, working on a new thing. What are you doing? You tell me. I got a new solo record I just started on uh, with Rodney Crowell yeah. producing my old friend Rodney. You, you guys know? have done a lot of shit together. Yeah, you know, we go way back, almost 20 years too. Yeah. But we've never worked together on my music. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought you guys had done records too. I've together. played on a bunch of his records. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm excited about that, man. We got five songs already, we got half a record. Oh man! In two days, would you be comfortable telling the homeschoolers that the famous Mark Knopfler story? <laughs> <laughs> hey, of course, you could change it a little if you need to. To, to no, I wouldn't no, change. No, you wouldn't change. I wouldn't change anything. This is the greatest story I have ever heard in my life, and I've asked Jed to tell it a hundred times. Have I not? Yeah, I, I love mean, this story. hey man, the. the True stories are always the best ones. Okay, so just always, a little backstory, and then I'll let him take over. Uh, Jed, what year did you come out with <coughs> uh, uh, your first solo album? Uh, 2004. Okay, comes out with the album 2004, and, and like, uh, it's a big hit. And every, like, Mark Knopfler apparently got a hold of it. Yeah. And uh, you take over. Okay. You take over. Yeah, you take right. over. Yeah. So, um... So apparently I heard through the grapevine that Mark Knopfler was a fan of my record. And I was like, holy shit, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then I had a, this friend of mine, um, he was my A&R guy at my record yeah. label. He said, um, hey, Mark reached out and he said, um, if you would ever want to get together and write, he would be down for that. And... I was like, holy shit. Okay, cool. Um, well then I'll I'll book this, I'll book a trip. You must have been dying. Oh yeah. You were like what, 20? I was 22. 22, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right, okay. Uh, so I'll book a trip to London. And, Cause you're um, a huge fan, right? That's what, that was my. Massive I mean, fan. Massive fan, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One of the, my favorite, I think he's one of the most underrated songwriters Lyricist. of all time. Lyricist, for Fuck sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, 
so I booked this trip to London and I was like, all right. Um, I just casually said to my friend, I said, hey, I'm gonna be in London this week. You know, if there's any way Mark would wanna get together, like, that would be incredible. Yeah. He said, well, look, I'll reach out. It's right. Probably a bit of a long shot, but if I hear something, I'll right. let you know. Right. Okay, great. And um, at the same time, I was dating this blonde, gorgeous blonde bird <laughs> <laughs> from LA. This is pre-family, way, way, oh, this way, is, way, way, This back. is almost 20, yeah, 20 years, years ago, right. for my incredible family that I right, have now. Right, right, right. And uh, this is back in my swinging single swinging days. Swinging single days. And um, so I was dating this gorgeous girl and um, I was on the plane and I was like, I booked my hotel and I thought, well, maybe I'll just reach out to this girl and see if she wants to hang out in London right, for a week. Right. So I sent her an email. Right. This is before like cell phones, right. Right. like international cell phones and the whole bit. You couldn't travel like that. Yeah. So I didn't have any of that kind of access. All I had was the email dial-up right. shop around the corner, you know? Yeah. So I sent her a message. She sent one back. She was like, yeah, definitely. You know, I'll come meet you in London. Great. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Right. So she came into town and I was so jet lagged that I never quite got on London time. You right. know, I was like sleeping in till one and then I was up till four, right. Right. you know, like the whole time. Yeah. Takes and, you um, to get used to it, right? Yeah. 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 Or, yeah solid yeah. week to kind of get mm -hmm. above ground. Anyway, so she came over and she met me in the subway. I got a great little <laughs> aside side story for this too. <laughs> You will love this one. I don't know if I've ever told you this part. No, okay. So my publisher at the time, mind you, let me tell you this. I was 22. Right. I was signed to a major label and I was also being paid 75 grand a year to write songs. Yeah, dude. And party, basically. Right. Mostly party and then write a few songs, which is right. what ended up happening. Right. And so they were paying me a shitload of money, which I completely pissed away. Yeah. And um, my publisher was like, hey, there's this hit songwriter in London we want to hook you up with. His name's Steve McEwen, right. who we both know and love. Yeah, that's true. And I was like, okay, great. Yeah. yeah, I'll go write a song with this guy. So my girl gets in town and I meet her at the subway and I said, hey, I'm going to write. Uh, I've got to go to this writing session. I'm going to go write with this guy. Um, you can hang out in the cafe around the corner or, or whatever. It'll just take a few hours and then I'll meet back up with you. She was like, okay, great. Anyway, it's pouring rain that day. And she comes with me and she comes into this writing session. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she basically sits down in the room and I'm like, at what point is she going to leave? Oh, God. She didn't know. She didn't know. She had no idea, you know. And so I'm sitting there with this huge hit pop songwriter trying to write this song and she starts chiming in. No, she didn't. Yes, she did. On, uh, you know, when, you know, like there's a bit of a pause when you're just trying to think of a line for a song or whatever. No. I suddenly hear this voice behind oh me like, God. oh, you could rhyme this word with that word. And I had just met Steve for the first time and I was oh like, my, you never told me that. Yeah. What did he do? This is the beginning of the trip. He just, he was an absolute champ about it. Like he just kind of laughed it off and... Poor thing, she had no idea. She had no idea. And we kind of got through it. And, and she hung out the whole time. She hung out the whole time and um, was just in the back of the room. Sweet Jesus. So, of course, like I'm not checking my emails because she's in town. And then I get an email from my friend in America that's like, hey, Mark definitely wants to get together. He's going to send a car for you <laughs> to the hotel. You were dying. I didn't, didn't get this email until I got back to America. <laughs> <laughs> he sends his whole email. Mark definitely wants to get together. He's going to send a car for you to London and just go stay with him for a night or two. And you guys can work on some music. You know, he loves the record. Very excited about doing this. So this is a whole message that I never get. 
And I, I spend the next three days in London with this chick and just still kind of mortified by this whole songwriting experience, which I had also started to get emails about from my publisher because they were like, who the fuck was in the room with you when we set up this co-write? We got an email from Steve and apparently you dragged your girlfriend along with this fucking thing. Like, what are you thinking? So I get back home to the US and I check my email and I see this email from my friend David Conrad. Right. And I read it and my heart just crumbles oh, Jesus. to pieces. Because it's like, ah, oh, fuck. Mark sent a car and you were partying down. You didn't even. Didn't even get the you message. Went over to go hang with him. Didn't oh, have a Lord. phone to get a message. Right. I was never going to get the message. Jesus. And then I get this other long list of emails from my publisher, like, what the fuck are you doing? What are you thinking? We set you up with this hit songwriter, and you bring your girlfriend to the writing session, and Mark Knopfler sent this car for you, and what, I'm like, what are you doing? You know? Oh, boy. And I got back, and it was just... The beginning of the end. Sure. I mean, the beginning of the end had already happened because I was yeah. like, I didn't know what I was doing, you know. I was like, yeah. I didn't really have any support, you know, like I, yeah. <laughs> or anybody to tell me that I was screwing it's up. It's weird having a record deal, right? I've never had one, and uh, I can't imagine the pressure. Yeah. Like, you're, every day you have to just, I mean, what was it like? Well, what was weird was, my natural instincts as a musician is to like never do the same thing twice, right. you know, because it's just, to me, yeah. that's just when things get boring. Yeah. But when you have a major record deal and you've recorded these songs, right. they expect to hear them the same way every time. And that was so counterintuitive right. to who I was that I just I didn't even compute. Right. So yeah. I had this little trio and we had worked up these yeah. songs in a way that I was like, well, let's just play it different every time because otherwise we're going to get bored and batshit. Yeah. And then the label would come see me play and they'd be like, what the fuck? Oh this God. doesn't sound like the record. Oh, God. <laughs> I remember that the first time, one of the first times I ever saw you play live was at, uh, what was that place I saw you at? You, I walked in, you were playing a Duesenberg. It was the old basement. The old basement, and the tone was to die for, man. I mean, Jed always gets a fucking amazing tone, but I was like, oh, who the great. fuck? Is, like, what is that guitar? I'd never even seen a Duesenberg before. Now, what year do you reckon that was? That would have been uh, 2005. Yeah, man. And then I promptly called Nathan. Yeah. From Duesenberg with your, with your, you hooked me up with him, right? And uh, I called him, and yeah. I had him send the same model you had which Stop was the yeah. well actually okay no that wasn't right there because you had that and i i got the first one i ever got was uh oh you got a double cap no it was one of those uh john platania oh. it was like a big hollow body a gretchy looking thing oh that's right and um with the pies over there? yeah and it was amazing yeah and i loved it and i played that a long time and i and i i think i jerry mcpherson has the matching there was two of them huh. They were similar, and Jerry has the other one. And uh, yeah, right. What the hell did I do with that guitar? Mm. Another one I should have. It was red. It was red. And yeah. It sounded amazing. That's where I got the idea of putting the piezo mm. on mine because yeah, that right. thing had that, had that really cool one. Yeah. And uh, man, you know that's been the start of a great thing. I'm, you know, I always say people think I'm a vintage snob. They, they probably think the same of you, right? Yeah. I mean, but we're not really, are we? If something new came along, yeah. I would love to. The, the 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 Duesenbergs are the only like new guitars that I ever connected with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You find the occasional good Fender or Gibson, you know, like I love that Paul Reed Smith that he made me. Uh, but like in general, like it's tough to beat these old ones, man. You know, it's tough, right? It's like. Yeah. But I'm not, I don't, I'm not a vintage snob. Like if, if something <coughs> comes along, I try everything I get my hands on. If it delivers, it delivers. Right? Man, 
If it inspires in any way, that's really all that matters. Okay. Right there. That's all that matters. Right? Yeah. So, um, every time I see Jed, I always ask him, you know, what you've been looking for on Reverb, you know, what's been the hot Reverb search lately? We always, you know, we have a history of uh, we've we have bought and sold back and forth piles of guitars, you and I, and amps and things. Yeah. Um, you know what I always think about was that '57. ES 350T. Oh, that was a cool guitar. Remember that? God, that guitar. That's when I first met Sarah. I had that guitar. It was a beautiful blonde um, 350, and, the, and it had really early PAFs. Yeah. The earliest PAFs. Even Bubba told me this, my guitar guru that taught me all this shit. The very earliest PAFs, the covers look like they're painted. Yeah. They use some kind of different... I'm coating on them. They look totally painted different. silver. Yeah. And man, that guitar was fucking cool, man. Short scale. Yeah. And it, but I always thought that guitar was way too classy for me. It was so clean. Too. So clean. God. You know, it was out of my league there. Uh, well, for me too, apparently. Uh, but, you know, it, it was, it, you really couldn't use it for anything, but it was fucking cool, man. No, it was cool. It was sexy it was, as hell, but no, yeah, it was, not really practical. Yeah. I mean, we've been through piles of Gretsch's. We've been through, um, Jed, you know, Jed's, you oh, know, I've always been on the search for the perfect telly. We were just talking a minute ago, like, I mean, I, I want to find the perfect bridge pickup for this guitar. And I, anybody has any ideas out there? People say, what are you looking for in a bridge pickup? And I say, I want it to be dangerous, loud, and like, like if you s took a fucking blazing P90 and made it sound like a telly. Yeah. And, but the, the problem is like what I'm finding, I, I've talked about this on, on some of my older videos, like I love old, the early flat pole, you know, the early 50s, but they're, I've tried two different 50s flat poles in this guitar and they're cool, but every string is a different volume. Mm. Like, because they're, they're, the balance between the strings is, is like way off, right? Which is probably why they went to the stagger pole in, yeah. in you know, what, 53 or whatever. Yeah. But I love the dangerous part of those pickups, but I just can't play them because they don't work for me. I mean, some guys, they work for some people. Vince seems to like them, you know? Yeah. But I just can't play them, man. Um, I, I got to have consistent string-to-string -string volume. I can't, yeah. I'm not, I can't be bored, I'm self-mixing. Yeah. Right? I can't do that. So. I do enough of that already. What is a, what I is a, Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, man. Does someone have a guitar that you wish you had? Mm hmm And these guys know exactly which one it is, too, because I've talked. The only guitar that I've ever truly coveted that someone else has is that fucking 60... Telly Custom, the Dan Arbog guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. That guitar. Really? That's the best Telly I have ever seen. Damn. That guitar is fucking made out of pure magic. Wow. Have you ever played it? Nope. The one I've got now, I bought a 60, you know, that's very similar, and it's really good. Yeah. But the one he has is just... Not of this, or these people are sick of hearing me talk about it. I've talked about it a million times. Yeah, right. But um, Dan would never sell a guitar, and, I, and, I, and it belongs there. His studio, he uses it on everything, and he yeah. gets amazing sounds out of wow. it. Wow. But there's that guitar is so fucking great. What's it do that it, it, it's, gets you? It's just, it's got everything you could ever dream of in, a, in a, an amazing guitar. It's like, huh. it sounds like. It's got such a fucking, it so sounds like records, man. Oh, wow. That's the ultimate compliment I can give any guitar. It sounds like records. Yeah. This thing, everything you play on it sounds like it's been on a classic recording, man. It's just, wow. and it's light and it's resonant, but it's also very funky and sort of like, um, it's just magic, man. Wow. It's just magical. Huh. It's such a cool guitar. I mean, what about you? Has anybody else ever had a guitar? Man, there's one. This is kind of a strange story, too, because 
Dave Henson. Yeah, from Killer Vintage. Killer Vintage yeah. showed up to a Vince gig with a black god, 51, that he brought into the dressing room, and Vince was still up on stage. Yeah. I have a weird superstition about this. Yeah. And tell me if you agree. If someone is bringing a, a guitar to you and someone else plays it before you do, I think something can happen in the transition okay. of the person getting the instrument. Fucks with the inter interferes with the vibe. I think there could be something. I don't know. Okay. That probably sounds absolutely ridiculous, but hey, give me a little more on that. Okay, so he brought it to the dressing room, and I played this dead clean fifty-one tone blender circuit. Right. You know, like early. Yeah. Prototype. Smaller neck. Right. Like Vince likes, you know. Yeah. And I played this guitar 51 for a while, just acoustic, and I was like, holy shit. I mean, you just knew it was right. lightning, right? Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And then Vince came in, and he was like, hey, uh, what do you think of that telly? And I was like, well, I know you're going to love it because it's got the neck shape yeah, you love. Right. The smaller telly neck. Yeah. And he played it for a while and he was like, yeah, great. And, um, and then we plugged it in, man. And it was just like the bridge pickup was oh, literally the best Telecaster bridge pickup I've ever heard in my life, man. Yeah. It was like a mile wide God. and just... I had this connection with that guitar like no other. Yeah. And I played it for for a while. Do you like, know which city you're in? Where it was? Yeah, yeah. We were in um we were in Oklahoma in one of those right. casinos north of Dallas, you know, like right. um uh, uh wind something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Casino. It's like a two thousand seater. Our lady of the two drink minimum. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I love that lady. Man, mm -hmm. I played that guitar and I knew it was mine. And I think he kind of knew it too, but you know, I couldn't drop that kind of dough on a guitar. Yeah. And, and he got it. And um, I went and picked it up for him a few weeks later. Did you? He was like, hey, can you, can you uh, do me a favor? And we were doing that crossroads air clapping yeah. thing. He was like, hey man, I got this bag full of money, cash. He was like, you gotta go straight to Killer Vintage and pick up this guitar. And I was like, yeah, okay. He was like, you gotta go straight there. He was like, this is a lot of money. I was like, yeah, of course, man. You know, that was cool of you to do that. Yeah, I was yeah. Happy, happy to do it, you know. So I went there and a big pile of dough and I was like, hey Dave, came to get Vince's telly, you know, here's the cash. Yeah. And, Wow. I was like, cool, man. Counted it out. It was a couple hundred short. Was it? <laughs> uh, and I was yeah. like, Jesus, man. Spoilage. Yeah. Right? It's right. got to be a couple hundred. Yeah. No. Tell Vince. He owes me 300. All right. Uh, so I picked it up. Oh. And I took it back. And man, the whole time I was like, shit, man. I wish this was my guitar. Was it a... It feels like, like it should be. Was it a lightweight one? Real? It was... Medium weight, yeah. It wasn't like a feather or nothing, right? But it wasn't an anchor either, right? But man, those pickups were just like it was like staring into Lake Tahoe, God. into that water, you know. I know the feeling. You know, it's like uh, it's so uh, deep, and you know you can get so much out of it, but you see the bottom, and it's like fuck. Kind of almost like with a woman, the possibilities of what you could, you know, like when you meet the perfect person, like you do the the possibilities of the future what, what that could be like right you saw that with that guitar wow right yeah and all the shit that could have happened yeah but it didn't yeah all right no am i getting too deep here <laughs> <laughs> not at all <laughs> oh lord okay so but i know where it is so that's good. okay and if this has it still yeah, and of course, you know, being the prince that he is. He's, he's like, the coolest. He's like, man, if you ever you want to yeah. use this, you just call right. me and come get it any time, you know. Man. Um, That's still the best black guy I've ever played. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I know the guitar. I mean, I'm, when you go over there, he's got that whole 
pile of black guards just sitting there. I mean, yeah. God, how many does he have? He must have 14, 15, yeah. 16. Yeah. What about the best acoustic you've ever touched? Oh, man. man. The first one that got me was Marty Stewart's D45. Oh, man. Have you played that guitar? Never played it. Nah. Is it amazing? That thing is ridiculous, man. Is it? It is so alive. Oh, God. Is it like a, four, like a 44? Yeah. 43 or something? I guess so, yeah. yeah. They only made them a couple of years, eh? Yeah. Well, yeah. They, 42, 43. Yeah, it's a bone. It's a bone. Yeah. Oh, man. Maybe it's the 30s. It could be late 30s. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's unreal. Wow. It is unreal. That one, that was the first great acoustic guitar I ever played. Kenny Vaughan handed it to me yeah. at a Marty Stewart session that I just went by. Right. Kenny was like, man, you should come by and meet Marty. Right. He let me play that in the Clarence guitar, and I was just like, holy shit. Yeah. What was that like? It was so heavy. It was yeah, like, it's like two bodies. Two machine. bodies, yeah. It's like 11 pounds, like a heavy Les Paul. One body's too heavy for us <laughs> with bad backs, right? Let alone two. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Okay, have you ever seen... Uh, uh, Elliot's Elliot Rumbleseed has a, a 59 triple pickup Black Beauty that is fucking out of this world. Are you like, no? I don't usually go for those. I, I've never seen one, another one that I even liked, let yeah. alone loved. Yeah. I've owned a bunch of those and never had a great one. And, uh, yeah. Man, he's just, he's got this one that is just fucking crazy. Wow. It's so good. Did he tell you where he got it? Yeah, I, he's had it for ages. I think it's just like one of his favorite guitars. Mm. He'd never sell it. Um, God. What guitar do you think, um, if someone thought of you, I mean, I know Italian in general, but what guitar, what particular individual guitar is most identifiable with you? Like, which one have you had the longest? Or, <coughs> or like, I would say it's probably my... Australian made Degrucci. Oh, yeah, your acoustic. Acoustic. Right? It's yeah. Brazilian. It's a really old set of Brazilian rosewood and it's That's uh, a cool guitar. Yeah. Man. Yeah, it's a really you've had that for ages. I got a lot of miles on that one. Like yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that thing's that thing's cool. Yeah. That's my main Yeah. Plunka. This is my favorite acoustic I've ever had, this this bone. That's the best one you've ever had. Best one, yeah, here. Play it, here. Yeah. Play me, play me some chords and I'll run out of the juice here.
<laughs> All right, yeah. so the homeschoolers know that um, it takes me forever to upload videos on my antiquated Wi-Fi system. Oh, yeah. It takes me forever to upload a 15-minute video. This one's an hour and three minutes. But thanks for watching, you guys. Jed Hughes, Good one of my favorite guys. humans on this planet. Thanks for, for doing this, dude. Oh, yeah. It's super yeah. cool. Check you. out his channel, Jed in the Shed. Two, G, two Ds. Two Ds. Two Ds, all right. Oh, yeah. All right, guys. Have a good night. Cheers. Yeah.